Okay, everyone. Hello, and welcome to Introduction to Jupyter Notebooks. It's a part of the Data at Your Desk workshop series. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, my name is Liam Worsansky. I'm the STEM Libraries Graduate Assistant here at Dirac Library at FSU. Um, and I'm super thankful for the opportunity to be here and to be teaching this workshop to you guys. Um, oh, let me just check the chat really quickly. Yes, so actually I was just about to get to the housekeeping, but great question. So um, th this workshop is going to be recorded um, and that will be sent out to everyone in attendance as well as posted on um, our research data management libguide once that is all complete and edited, as well as the slides. Those will also be sent out um, to everyone that's been, that attends this meeting. Um, let's check that again. Terrific, yes. Um, and actually these slides will be super helpful for after the presentation as well, because I go into a little bit more depth um, and instruction in those slides um, than I might be going um, through the workshop today. Awesome. Um, and yeah, as you guys have been doing, please feel free to leave any questions that you might have in the chat. Um, I do have some assistance that will, you know, let me know if I don't see anything, um, but I will get to your questions as soon as I can. And please feel free um, to drop those uh, whenever you have one. Awesome, so let's get started then. So just a brief session overview, what are we gonna be doing today? Um, we're gonna be learning um, how to install, launch, and create a notebook. This I'm not going to go over in too much depth because um, I can't download and install um, Jupyter Notebook onto my local machine, but this is sort of, like I mentioned before, how the slides will be helpful after the presentation. I go in depth about how to install um, Jupyter Notebooks on your local machine. Um, in this presentation um, and give you guys resources to, to do that as well. So we're going to be installing, launching, and creating a notebook, um, a, learning the difference between code cells and markdown cells, um, learning how to import libraries and use magic commands. Um, we're going to be plotting and visualizing data and then exporting notebooks and learning how to collaborate with them. So just a little bit about this workshop. Um, like I mentioned, we're going to be installing and setting up the notebooks. Um, we're going to be sort of going over the basics of navigating the user interface of Jupyter Notebooks, how to plot um, and visualize data, how to import libraries and run commands, how to cl collaborate and share your data. Um, but I really want to specify, even though I will be doing live coding and programming during the demonstration, um, it's more so to demonstrate the functionality and range of capabilities of Jupyter Notebooks. So I want to clarify that this will not serve as a formal introduction to coding um, or programming. Awesome. Perfect. Okay, let's continue on. So what is Jupyter Notebooks? What is Jupyter Notebook? So Jupyter Notebook is a web-based interactive computing platform that allows users to create sh and share documents that contain live code, equation, visualizations, and other um, text. So the really great thing about Python is that it supports over, did I say Python? <laughs> the great thing about Jupyter is that it supports over 40 different programming languages, including Python, R, Julia, and Scala. Today we will be using Python for the purposes of this workshop. Um, it's one of the most common um, programming languages and one of the most popular ones to use um, in Jupyter Notebook. So um, the, one of the really great things about Jupyter Notebook is that it promotes accessibility and collaboration, which is really huge when it comes to data sharing and its application in multiple various different um, arenas, environments, and instances. So. Um, it allows users to be able to develop their programs while interactively monitoring the output of the code. Awesome, so just a little bit of history about Project Jupyter and how Jupyter Notebook came to be. So Jupyter Notebook falls under the umbrella of Project Jupyter and it's one of the few interactive computing products that was created under its umbrella. So other ones um, include Jupyter Hub and Jupyter Lab. We'll actually briefly look at Jupyter Hub a little bit later. Um, but Project Jupyter aims to develop open, so open source software standards and services for interactive computing across multiple programming languages. Um, and this was spun off from IPython in 2014. So um, I included a little picture so that you guys could visualize this, um, but Project Jupyter's name is actually a reference to the three core programming languages that's supported by it. So Julia, Python, and R, so JPR, sort of get that sound of Jupyter. And then the logo actually um, symbolized Galileo's discovery of the moons of Jupiter as documented in his notebook. So it's a nice little um, analogy there. 
of symbolism. Okay, let's continue. So this is the portion I was talking about setting up the Python or the Jupyter notebook on your um, computer. So I'm just going to talk about it a little bit and show you how to open a command shell to run some of these commands, but I won't be going through this in depth. So the first thing that you're going to want to do is to locate um, and see if your computer is already pre-installed with Python. What you'll do if it isn't is you'll follow this link and download it. Um, and by you can check the version of Python using this command in the um, command line. So I'm going to quickly stop sharing this and I'm going to just share my screen in general. Oops, escape from that. All right, so all you need to do to open your command show, so you can just type in CMD right there and it'll open it up. Perfect, and that command that I mentioned was Python minus minus version. So if you type that in, I'm not expecting to get it. Python isn't um, downloaded on this computer. So um, unfortunately it is a school computer, so I'm not able to install anything, which is why I can't show you the whole process. But that is what you would do to check the Python version. So once you see, oh, look, it's not in there, I would then go and install it. Then I'm gonna go back to here. So following that, you would then install pip. And what pip is, is a package management system written in Python, and that's used to install and manage different software packages. Um, the Python Software Foundation actually recommends using pip for installing Python applications and its dependencies during deployment. So all you'll need to do is follow this link and you'll be able to save the file. Um, and then all you'll need to do is again, open that same command shell terminal, um, navigate to the folder of the file that you just saved, so where it is in the directory, and then run the command um, that's listed right there. Then should run, should be successful, and you'll then follow it um, by running another pip command to install Jupyter Notebooks. So that's how you'll have it and you'll be able to run Jupyter Notebooks on your local machine without internet, without um, any sort of hitch beyond um, just having it on your local machine, which is fantastic. Um, however, um, there are a bunch of other different instances where we can use Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so just to give you guys a brief um, look at how it'll look on your um, local machine once you open up Jupyter Notebooks. So you'll type in the command in your command terminal, open, or excuse me, Jupyter Notebook, and then this will come up in your browser. It'll open your file directory. This happens to be what mine looks like on my local machine. Um, you may have a few similar folders, but this is the general aesthetic that you will get the view. Um, and then you can go into um, whatever folder you want to create a notebook in and then start creating there. So what does a Jupyter Notebook sort of look at, look like, excuse me, um, when you're in the local machine? This is um, what you want to do. You'll select your kernel language. In this case, we're going to be using Python. So that'll be right up there in that new. And you're going to select Python 3. And then you're also going to want to change the title of the file's name. So that way you can distinguish it and keep track of it much more easily. Awesome. So I mentioned there are other ways to install and use Jupyter Notebook. So we have Anaconda, which is a distribution of the Python and R programming languages for scientific computing and that aims to simplify package management and deployment. Um, the distribution includes data science packages um, that are suitable for Windows, Linux, and um, Mac. So um, this Anaconda software can help you create an environment for many different versions of Python and package different versions as well. Um, and like I mentioned, you can use it to install, remove and upgrade packages in your project's environment. Um, you can also use it to deploy any project instantly. Um, below here, I also linked a past Jupyter Notebook workshop that we did um, that specifically goes into detail about FSU's Research Computing Center's open on-demand server. Um, so you can access this as a student or faculty member of FSU um, use Jupyter Notebook on their local server um, and also use it to compute the data that you upload. So super helpful. Um, I definitely recommend checking that out um, and the link to that video is right here. 
Awesome. So, but for today, um, I don't want you guys to have to install anything. I don't want you guys to have to create an account anywhere. So we're going to be doing the live coding on something called Jupyter Lite. Um, I have the link right here. So I'm going to drop that into the chat for everybody and I'll be going through how to set it up. So um, don't worry about that. But really the benefits of Jupyter Lite is that there are no files needed um, to be downloaded onto your local machine. It's basically an easy shareable code space with URL, URL links. Um, and you can think of it similar to the style of like a Google Doc that you would share. Um, so obviously there are data storage benefits to anything that's on the cloud and online, but also additional security risks to that data that you want to consider when using this. So I like to think of this as a good sort of practice programming um, environment. For our benefit, I think for this workshop, it'll work perfectly. Um, but I definitely recommend using other um, things such as JupyterHub that you have to use to create an account for or running it on your local machine. Um, in that sense, you're getting the most up-to-date version of Jupyter Notebook, um, as well as you know, mitigating those security risks. Awesome. So we're going to go to Jupyter Lite really quickly. Perfect. Just to show you guys how to set up. So this is the web page that you guys will get once you click that link. Um, and as you can see, this is really um, Jupyter's way of encouraging people to try um, their programming software um, and tools. That way you guys can get a feel for it, understand the interface without having to fully commit um, into downloading and installing different software, creating accounts. So as you can see, I can create a Jupyter notebook um, or I can create Jupyter, or I can go into Jupyter Lab. For today, we're gonna go into Jupyter Lab just because I like the way that the interface looks a little bit better and it's a little bit more similar to what you would typically see um, running this locally on your machine. So I'm going to actually get rid of that. Perfect, okay. So as you can see, we are brought into a notebook um, and it has the I intro.ipynb so that way we know it's a Python notebook. Um, so say we wanted to create a new one, super easy. We just click it as if it was a new tab and we can open a new notebook. So I'm gonna click on that. So that's the kernel. I've selected the Python kernel and I can always go and switch it over here. So they've got a few different or options. And then we've got the untitled. We're going to want to rename that. So in the normal local machine, you could just double click on that tab and it would let you um, rename it. But in this case, we're going to have to do a right click and then rename. So for today, we're just going to use um, workshop underscore practice as the file name. Great. So we've got workshop practice. Terrific. So now we've got our notebook set up. I'm gonna move back to our first, or to our slideshow, excuse me, just so I can go over what, what are cells, because that's really what we're gonna be working in. The main sort of structure of Jupyter Notebooks is working in code cells, code and markdown cells. So what's the difference? <laughs> well. You can run cells in the same way, but when you run a markdown cell, the output is formatted using markdown syntax. So you can think of that as stylized text versus code cells that just run code. So um, when you open a new cell by default, all of the notebook, um, when you open a new cell, it'll always stick to code. So you'll need to make sure that you change it to markdown um, and you can shift the cell to make it a markdown on the key at the top of the navigation. So I'll show you guys in just a second. Um, and here's some shortcuts as well um, to make things just a little bit easier. So just to give you guys an example of what that'll look like, um, markdown text looks like this, um, kind of similar to maybe how your output um, HTML might look, um, but it's different stylized text. You can make different headers. You can put in bullet points, um, whereas your code cells will look more like this, um, actual code that's doing something. So. What people really like to use markdown cells for is to sort of contextualize, explain, comment, caption the code um, or the program that's um, being done. Awesome. So just some tips and features to consider when running Python or when running Jupyter Notebook, 
Um, so you can interrupt or restart a running kernel at any time. Uh, I'm gonna go over that, show you how to do that. Um, you can export your notebooks into other formats like Python or HTML. Um, so if I wanted to actually export one of the notebook files that I'm working on um, and bring it somewhere else, you know, upload it maybe onto GitHub, or if I even wanted, I had a Python notebook and I wanted to work on it, um, I can just drag it into this directory and bring it in. Um, so I'll also show you how to do that as well. So press control and enter to run a cell or shift and enter to run a cell and add an additional one below it. Nice little oop, shortcut. Um, you can navigate between cells using the arrow keys in the navigation menu at the top of the notebook. Um, your mouse also works just as well, but another way that you can navigate. Um, you can also collapse and compress your output by clicking the left space of the code block. Um, I'll show you guys how to do that as well. And a lot of this will make sense once we start coding so you can see how things are gonna look and stack up. So you can auto-complete a cell's code by clicking the tab key and any line that begins with an exclamation point, um, that is considered a shell command. And in Jupyter Notebook, a shell command is a command that can be executed in the system's command line interface directly from a Jupyter Notebook cell. So these commands are often referred to shell commands because they are executed within a shell or terminal environment. Um, using shell commands in Jupyter Notebook can be really helpful when you need to interact with um, the underlying operating system and perform tasks that aren't possible um, just using Python alone. So, um, for example, you can use shell commands to install packages, download files, or run scripts that aren't written in Python. Awesome. So, um, again, this is an instant of where the slideshow is going to be really helpful for you guys. Um, I'm going to start live coding now, but if you guys want to follow along with the examples that I'm doing, Obviously, you can code and try to do that on your own, following along with me. I've also linked a notebook that, complain, that contains, excuse me, all of the examples that we'll be going through, which that also includes markdown text to sort of explain and contextualize what we'll be doing. So we're going to start with importing libraries into the notebook. So oops, just to sort of give you guys an idea what I mean by this example notebook, I'm just going to pull it up really quickly. So this is hosted on GitHub. I have um, example notebooks for all of the things that we'll be doing today, um, but you guys can access this and see sort of an overview of what we're doing, okay? Perfect, so I'm gonna actually head over to Jupyter Lite and we're going to start with importing libraries, which is fantastic. So, give me one second, perfect, okay. So the first thing that we're going to want to do in this notebook is to import the different libraries. Um, and we're going to start by importing two popular Python libraries, um, which are NumPy and Pandas. Um, these libraries are commonly used for data analysis and manipulation of tasks, such as um, working with large data sets, performing mathematical operations, and creating data visualizations. Um, and by importing these libraries, we gain access to a range of powerful tools and functions that we can use to explore and analyze or visualize our data. So all you'll need to do is to import them. Perfect. And this is one cell. Again, this is what a code cell looks like. So you get that aspect. So great, we've got the imports. I'm going to run it by clicking that run button up here. Um, as you can see up here, you can also restart the kernel and run through all the cells at once. We only have one cell, so that doesn't make any more sense than this button does in this case. Oop, and I already made a mistake. Perfect. So see, I forgot the as and it gave me an invalid syntax. So I'm going to run that again. Great. And I didn't get an error this time, so I know that it went through. So once we've imported our libraries, now we can actually start beginning to work with our data. So in this example, we're going to define a dictionary called data that contains temperature and wind data. Um, and these are just points that I made up, data that's made up, um, but is relevant and sort of um, good to sort of leave and pave the way for the actual data that we will be using um, in one of our later examples. So, um, what we're going to do is to create a pandas data frame using this dictionary, um, and we'll use NumPy and pandas to help us with the data ana analysis and manipulation tasks. 
So the data dictionary has two keys, like I mentioned, temperature and wind, and those correspond to lists of numerical valuables. Numerical, got numerical values for each um, variable. So these values represent temperature measurements in degrees and wind speeds in miles per hour taken over a period of time. And with this data frame, we can actually perform a range of manipulation tasks such as sorting, filtering, and aggregating our data. So let's set this up. And all of this is in the actual format um, that it should be in. So we're gonna set our temperature dictionary and this is how dictionaries are formatted. Um, you have the value and then the other values on the side, 82, 91. So it's not a huge data set, but just enough for our purposes. Um, okay, we're gonna go wind. Perfect, and then set that up. So some high, high mileage per hour winds over here. Hopefully no one's getting any wind that powerful, but just in case, let me space this out. Okay, and then we're gonna end it with this a little curly Q is what I like to call it. Okay, and now we're going to also define the index as well. So when is this data taking place? Okay, so data index equals. So we're gonna do, oops, week 33. So now we're gonna close that and we'll be able to run it and we'll have our data frame. Perfect. So we're not again gonna get any output from that. This is all just for the Jupyter Notebooks memory. So it's gonna recall all of this um, as we go. So now we're actually gonna summarize that data with pandas. So once we have our data in um, the pandas data frame, we can actually easily generate summary statistics to help us understand our data. So in this example, I'm going to use the describe function. Um, so that way we can generate those summary statistics, including the count, the mean and standard deviation, min, max, and quartile values. Um, and using functions like this can help us really quickly gain insights on our data, um, such as understanding the distribution um, or identifying potential outliers. So do that, don't describe. Perfect, I'm gonna run that, and boom, we get this output, which is really great. Um, so it's describing all of those different um, values, like I mentioned, really nice and easy to sort of be able to tell. So count, there are only four values in each set. Mean, you're getting the average, the standard deviation, the minimum value, and all of those other quartile values that I mentioned. So now um, we can start applying functions to our data frame. So once we have the data in the data frame, we can apply um, various functions to it. Um, so for example, we can use the apply function with um, numpy.comSum to calculate the cumulative sum of our data over time. So what that would look like is, we're gonna call the data with index, and we're going to apply the numpy and p.comSum function, perfect. And we're gonna run that. And boom. So now we get the cumulative data over time. So it adds the um, week, it adds the value from the week before if you're looking at this table. So if you look above at the value 90 plus 85, if we're looking at temperature is gonna be 175. Um, then 175 plus 82 is gonna be 257 and so on and so forth. So um, in this case, it may not be too helpful with this specific data, um, but in other data, that might be a helpful tool to be able to use. Um, so other um, descriptive statistics that we can do and calculate 
Um, so I'm going to go data with index dot mean. Okay, let's run that. And boom, we get the mean temperatures, which we already get in this descriptive um, analysis. But if we just want the mean, that's also a function that we can put in. Awesome. So let's go into filtering a data frame. So we can actually use the query function to um, filter the database based on specific conditions. And in this example, we're going to select all the rows where the temperature is greater than or equal to 90. So we're going to again call data with index. And we're going to dot query. Then we're going to set the parameters. So temperature is uh, or excuse me, is greater than or equal to 90. And then we'll close that and let's run it. Perfect. And as you can see, it gives us the two times, uh, the two instances, excuse me, that the temperature is higher than 90. So there is a higher than 90 temperature on week 33 and week 36, and it got rid of the other data. So this can be really helpful if you need to isolate a certain type or a certain number uh, or range of values um, to identify when those occurrence, occurrences took place. So you can also apply even more filters um, using different logical operators, such as, um, in this case, we're gonna select the rows where the temperature is both greater or equal to 90 and the wind speed is greater than 20. So we can actually copy this. We'll have to wait on me to type it. And all we're going to do is add an and as well as, okay, excuse me, data with index and parentheses. So data with index dot temperature. And that'll be greater than or equal to 90. Mm -hmm. And there we go. Data underscore with index dot wind. Make sure we're calling wind and specifying that greater than 20. Then we're going to close that. And let's see. Oops, it did not get that parentheses. All right. So let's run that and boom. It isolated just the, excuse, this week 33. Um, so only instance that it had a wind speed higher than 20 and also um, a temperature equal or greater than 90. Awesome. So now that we've done that, we can actually oops, finally use Pandas to export our data to other file formats such as Excel. So in this example, we're going to use the pick package manager to install the open PYXL library and this library actually allows us to read and write data to Excel files, making it useful, um, making it a useful tool for data analysis and manipulation. So to import this, um, we're simply going to run the code pip install open PYXL. However, um, if you guys are following along in my notebook, um, one downfall, say, of using Jupyter Lite is um, there are a few nuances. Um, we'll get to magic commands later and there have been a lot of feedback from users that not all magic commands work. Um, but in this case, we also have to format um, this pip a little bit differently. So normally we would just be able to type pip, but instead we're gonna have to add this percentage symbol. So pip install open PYXL. We're gonna run that. Perfect. Okay, Ooh, and I see a chat. Why do I get name error data with index is not defined? Yes, so one thing I, I, I should mention is when you guys are making changes, um, say you're, you're doing something up here, um, if the data in the program changes, you need to make sure that you restart the, the entire notebook so that it logically flows all the way down. Um, I can't be certain that's why um, it's not defined for you. Um, there could also be a syntax error that I can't see on your computer, but that would be my best guess as to why you're getting that error. 
um, and make sure you're setting that data with index variable up here as well. So you're creating that, that data frame. Awesome. Okay, so now we have open PYXL. Um, now we're going to take advantage of the functions and enhance our data analysis workflow. And we're gonna export our data frame to Excel um, in a file called my Excel. So let's do data with index dot to Excel. Then uh, my Excel X L S X. Then you also want to make sure you're setting the parameters. So sheet underscore name equals pandas. And then index label. So these are all the defaults that we're manipulating right now. Perfect, so I'm gonna run that. And as you guys can see, there should now be an Excel file in your directory called My Excel. So that's one way that you guys can import, or excuse me, export your data um, into different file formats. So in addition to doing that, we can also read this file back into Python using the read Excel function. So we're gonna do pd dot read underscore Excel my Excel dot XLSX and pandas and a and again, these are the default sort of structure for this um, function, which is why we have to set these parameters. Awesome. So now if we click run, it's able to read that Excel file that's in our directory. And, and this is the output that we get, which is great. Awesome. So by using Jupyter and these libraries, we can actually quickly and easily manipulate and analyze data, helping us to gain insights and make better decisions. Awesome. So that is the end of the first notebook example. I'm going to quickly pause and ask for any questions while I'm switching back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Perfect. And again, that notebook of examples is right here and you guys can access it using that button. Awesome. If there are no questions, let's just continue. Okay, so now we're going to talk about magic commands. So what are magic commands? Um, well, basically, magic commands are, oh, they're also called magic functions, and they are one of the really important enhancements that IPython offers to compared to the regular standard Python shell. So they're intended to solve common problems in data analysis using Python, and um, act also as convenient functions where the Python syntax is not the most natural one. Um, they're useful to embed invalid Python syntax in their workflow, and essentially it's built into the kernel and makes it easy to perform particular tasks like analyzing data that's in your notebook. Um, cool. So we're gonna go through some of these examples. Um, and again, like I mentioned, um, Jupyter Lite does not like all of the magic commands. I did some thorough research beforehand just to make sure I wasn't going anywhere incorrectly. Um, and I did try all of the suggested fixes, but I'll be able to go through all of those examples and show you how they work regardless. So again, if you need the notebook to follow along, that's going to be right there. But let's hop right in. So I'm actually going to do a different file. So new notebook right there. I just left click or right clicked to do that. Python, I'm going to rename this. Actually, I'm going to rename this magic commands. Um, practice. I'm also going to rename this workshop practice one just so that we can differentiate the files. So, oops, let's go with libraries. Oh gosh, I can't spell today. Libraries, workshop, practice, terrific, awesome. Okay, so just for now, I'm gonna close that libraries. I'm also gonna close the intro and we're gonna work with our magic commands. 
perfect. So we've got that all set up. So, oops, excuse me. Okay, so magic commands typically start with a percentage symbol um, or a double percentage symbol prefix, and those can be used to perform various tasks, such as listing available commands, defining aliases, changing working directories, and so much more. Um, so let's go over a few different examples. Um, this first one lists all of the different magic commands in Jupyter Notebook and can be really useful when you're not sure what commands are available or, or when you want to explore new functionalities. So we're gonna start out with ls magic. Let's run through that. So see, it's got two different types, so all of the line and then all of the cell as well. Perfect. So let's shrink those down. Okay, so if you add actually a question mark to that, question mark, this command actually will display all the documentation for it and a bit of a brief overview on what the command does and how to use it. So if you add that question mark to any command, that's the function that'll happen. Um, it'll give you a brief overview what the command does and how you can use it. Oops, let me run that. So lists currently available magic functions, terrific. All right, so let's move on to a different one. So this command displays documentation for the alias command. Um, this is one of the ones that halfway works. I can actually define the alias and use the alias command, but I, for some reason in this Jupyter Lite, it won't let me call back the alias. So I'll show you what that looks like in the other notebook once I'm done with this. So let's do this. So again, let's learn a little bit more about the alias function really quickly by adding that question mark. So we define an alias for our system command. It gives you all of this great information about it. Honestly, probably more than you need. Um, but it, it can be really, really helpful. Okay. So let's define and set an alias, um, a custom alias for this. And we're gonna call it data workshop. So what the point of this alias when you're calling, when you call it, the hope is that it will print the message, I'm learning so much, smiley face to the console. Um, so let's show you guys what that's supposed to look like. Alias um, data workshop. And then what it'll do is echo, I'm learning so much. And hopefully you guys are. Happy face, awesome. So this will work, it'll register, perfect. Um, but then when you call it in Jupyter Lite, you don't get the result you want. You get the error. So I'm just gonna delete this really quickly. I'm gonna show you what it's supposed to look like. So in my notebook, in my handy dandy notebook, So as you can see, when you call the alias data workshop, you get this output. I'm learning so much. Cool. So for some of these other ones, we'll go through, they may not all work as well, but we'll go through what all of them do. So this next command lists the files and directories um, in the current working directory that you're um, in, and that can be useful when you wanna verify that a file or a directory exists. Um, or even to possibly change a directory, which we'll do right after this. So all you'll need to do is percent ls and click run. Okay, so this is another one of those that doesn't work. Okay, there we go. So here, as you can see, you'll get all the files that are in my directory. In the case of this one, um, it is these five files. So actually, if I go into my code space, if it'll load. This is the live code where I can actually change it in GitHub, and you're looking at the public version. This is public, so I can't go in and change anything, right? Um, but if I, we're gonna also find that 
I believe this is what I was looking for. Yeah, so but here I can't change anything. So as you can see, you'll have all of these. And if I'm in my actual library, you can see all of the different files that it mentions right there. So data visualizations, library examples, magic commands, my Excel and Seattle weather. So that's what you should be seeing instead of this um, error that you get. Awesome. So continuing on, how you would want to display the current working directory is you would do percent PWD. And see, we've got the current directory. We're in notebooks folder um, under drive. So if I go back, this is called drive, I suppose. And then we're in notebooks. So say I wanted to actually change that. Um, see. Excuse me. Then we're going to go and change this actually to instead of notebooks, let's change it to data. So, all right. Oops, data not found. Terrific. Hmm. Okay, give me one second. Oh, excuse me. Okay. So this is one of those other things. It's the way that the syntax is written. So if we're going to change it to notebooks, oops, excuse me, that's what you would do. Hmm. Oh, okay. I see. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in notebooks. That that is why. Let's drive. Okay, I see. So because I'm already in notebooks, I can't change out because there isn't anywhere else to change. Um, but again, if you look here, as you can see, we're in notebooks, or excuse me, we're in code spaces data at your desk, and then we're able to change to notebooks using this command. And as you can see, it looks a little bit different. So the one downside, not one, one of the biggest downsides of this Jupyter light is that it, it tends to struggle a little bit with these magic commands. So, okay, I'm going to end on the magic commands there. Um, there are a bunch more that you can use, as I mentioned, um, and, and this question mark is, is one of, gonna be one of your most helpful tools um, in just learning what everything does, how it functions. Um, and of course, you can always look online um, for documentation as well. There are some really, really helpful resources out there. Okay, so now we are going to move into um, plotting and visualizing data. So what you guys probably all came here for and what you're going to mostly be using Jupyter Notebooks for. So using this link, and I'm gonna drop it in the chat, actually, let me escape. So the CSV file that we're gonna be using is in this um, Google folder that I'm gonna share with you guys now. So, oops. If you guys could go in, and I'm also gonna go in and save it too, so I can put it into my directory. You'll just click that. You're gonna download it. And then as you can see, it's gonna be down here. It may also be in your downloads folder. So now that you've got that, we're gonna go back into Jupyter Lite, the notebooks folder, and we're going to drag that in and see. It's now just like everything else, a part of this directory. All right, so let's open a new notebook. We'll select Python and let's rename this one to our data visualization practice. Visualization workshop. And I don't recommend making your, your titles for your files this long, but for the sake of this, it is totally okay. I'm sure I typed in something. Oh, no, I typed in everything spelled correctly. Fantastic, okay. So let me just pull this up. And again, if you guys wanna follow along in the data visualization notebook, um, you guys can go ahead and do that um, just by clicking this notebook right there. I'm gonna get rid of that as well, okay. So, like I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, 
Jupyter Notebooks allows you, Jupyter Notebook allows you to easily manipulate and visualize data um, using various different coding libraries, in this case, Python. Um, one such library, and we're gonna be using this one um, for this, these examples, is called Seaborn, and it provides a high-level interface for creating informative and attractive statistical graphics. Um, and we're gonna go through first how to install Seaborn. So the um, Seaborn library is a Python data visualization library based in matplotlib, and we can do this um, by using the pip install Seaborn command. So if you guys are following along in my notebook, um, remember that if we're using JupyterLite, that pip functions um, has to change to the percent. So pip install Seaborn. Let's run that. Perfect. Okay, great. So now that we've got um, Seaborn installed, now we need to import Seaborn as well as pandas, which we'll be using. Um, and those will provide fast and flexible data structures for working with tabular data. Um, and like I mentioned, the Seaborn will be used for the data visualizations. We'll also need to set the color code um, so that we can apply Seaborn's default color palette to all of the plots that we're using. And that's, um, again, some of the way that you can customize how some of these um, visualizations will look. Okay, so let's import those libraries, which we'll do in the same way that we did earlier. We'll import those, so import Seaborn as SNS. So let's set color codes equal to true. Perfect. Okay, let's run that. I don't know why I always forget the as. My apologies, everyone. Okay, and we're good. So now that we've got all of that set, great. Um, so now we need to we need this program to read the data, right? So all we'll need to do to read the data, the data from the SeattleWeather.csv file um, is to set it up and um, create a pandas data frame using the pd.readcsv function. And then that'll store it as a variable called Seattle weather. So Seattle underscore weather equal to pd.readcsv. And then we've got our file, Seattle underscore weather dot CSV. Perfect. Okay. Seattle. Ah. See, even one little mistake um, and it'll be wrong. So you guys make sure that you are reading everything carefully and I'm sure something isn't right. Read dot CSV. Let's see. No file. In. Well, the file's right here. Let's refresh this and let's run everything again. Okay. So let's wait for it, it's running, it's a little bit slow sometimes, but hopefully it'll recognize that we added the Seattle weather into the directory and it should work um, just fine. Or maybe not. <laughs> so this is also why some of these, um, why I also prepared this journal uh, or the notebooks for you guys on the side to follow along, just in case I make a mistake in the syntax or I'm struggling. So I'm gonna pull it up so this is actually kill another example um, that I wanted to show you guys. So what I've done is I have this in a Jupyter Lite example, this same notebook, um, and I've uploaded it to my own Google Drive. So if I go in my drive and I have this here, I'm gonna download it really quickly. So just like the Seattle weather, it should work similarly. If I pull that up, it adds to the directory. Um, and I can also, just to show you on the flip side of that, I can also download that file too. And I've got it right there. So it works in the same way. So just so that we can see what's going on, maybe I did something wrong. Let's grab that and let's paste. Hmm. 
Oh, okay, I see. There we go. So I don't think it liked the variable that I put, which is A-OK -okay and very fair. Um, awesome. So now that we've got that set up, let's actually view the data. So um, on the first few rows of the data, if we want to see that just to make sure that we've got the right data um, that we think that we're working on, um, we're going to use the head function. So all I would need to do is weather um, dot head and it should. Yep. See, and it'll display the first five values of each different column. Um, that way we know, we know we're working in the right file um, and we can just get a little bit of a preview of what is contained in that file. Um, say we say we wanted to maybe see a little bit more. Um, you can do as many rows as you want. All you'll need to do is in that little parentheses, you can consider it like N. So any number of rows that you want, you'll just put in that number in the parentheses. And remember, all of the data sets will always start at the value zero. So that first row counts as zero. So if there's 1461 values in the entire data set, then um, you'll get zero through 1460 instead of 14, one through 1461, if that makes sense. So let's copy this and instead of the first five, let's say we want the first 10. Um, let's enter that, boom, great. Now we've got the first 10. Awesome. So if we want to learn or view information about the data frame, such as the number of rows, columns, data types, um, then we can use the info function. So we'll just do weather dot info. Perfect. So as you can see, we've got all the different columns, date, precipitation, temp max, temp min, wind, weather, and then what type of um, values they are. So objects, date and weather um, versus like numerical values floats. So precipitation, temp max, temp min, wind, those are all going to be numbers as you can see versus like weather is an object and date is a number, but it's um, structured as an object. Option, or awesome, and you can see it also even counts those for you, how many floats, how many objects. Great, so now um, instead of just um, specifying general info, um, we want maybe some descriptive statistics like we were doing before. So I don't know if any of you guys remember what function we use um, in the, I believe it was the first example for the library's journal, uh, notebook. Um, we used the function describe. So let's do that. And then we'll get a full array of all of the different values and just all of the different summary statistics that we might need for this data. Awesome. Then, um, Say you don't like how the um, output is looking. Maybe it's not easy for you to read and you want to make it look a little bit differently. Maybe you want these, this column on top as the Y. Maybe you want the Y axis as the X axis or the X axis as the Y axis. It's a really super simple fix. All you'll need to do is to transpose it. And to do that, all you'll do is a period capital T. So now, instead of it looking like it normally did, we've switched the X and Y axis. Ooh, excuse me. And that might be easier to understand or read for some people versus this version. Awesome. So now we might want to, you know, in, in, in a, when you have a lot of data, there might all the data might not be relevant or interesting to you. You might only want to focus on one specific type of data. So I'm going to show you guys how to do that. So in this case, we're going to isolate the um, column weather. So we'll do weather, and then <laughs> also called weather. Okay, and that should select that column and we get a little bit of information. So a little bit of a preview. So the first five values, the last five values, 
the name of the column, how many values there are. So 1461, all of them are going to have that many values. And then, you know, what type the object. Awesome. So to view um, unique values in a specific column, so how many different types of values, because um, it's not a float, it's an object. And in terms of the weather, we can see a few, drizzle, rain, fog, sun, but we want to maybe know all of the different unique um, values that are in that specific column. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the unique function and um, this will display all of the different unique values for that data frame. So all we'll need to do is that, copy that, and we're going to type in unique, boom. Terrific. See, we've got drizzle, rain, sun, snow. I think snow might have been one of the ones that wasn't on here. So great, you know, we didn't know that might have, we might not have known that existed until we did that. So now we can differentiate all the different types of values that are there. All right, and then we can also um, group the data frame by a column and count the number of occurrences um, of each. So now we're going to count how many times um, using this function it drizzled, it rained, it fogged, it was sunny, um, how much each of those uh, occurred in this data set. So what we'll do is weather dot group by and we've got weather date dot count. Oops, and that's a function. All right, so when we run that, we can see, fantastic. Um, we've got 53, 101 for fog, 641 for rain, um, 26 for snow, and then 640 for sun. And again, we've got name, date, and then integer, perfect, okay. So let's move on to actual visualization of our data. So we've been working with Seattle or with the Seattle weather. In this case, I had to rename it for Jupiter light, um, just weather. But um, yeah, so let's start off with probably the simplest um, and most common type of graph, which is a bar graph or a bar plot in our case. So we'll start by calling Seaborn and we'll create the bar plot and we will type in weather. So that should create a bar plot of our data. Yep, so we've got that right there. And to just sort of give you guys some perspective on what the Seaborn library is doing, I, I sort of mentioned it, but probably I, I was even a little bit unsure of what it was doing at first to these specific data when I was practicing, um, but you get a lot more detail. So this gray background, these um, lines that indicate the different um, value ranges, all of that is added um, as a part of the Seaborn library. And it looks a lot sharper um, and easier to read because of that. So we've got all of these, which is great. Um, fantastic. Um, though, as I mentioned before, these are not the same type of data, so it's not maybe going to be smarter. It, you wouldn't necessarily group all of these types of data points into the same graph in this manner, right? Um, this is more just so that you guys can see how to generate these type of graphs. So um, say I wanted to make the graph run horizontally. Um, it's a very similar process. All you would need to do um, is to add an orientation parameter. Um, and again, it's defaulted to be at vertical orientation. So what I would need to do is put an H and that'll tell it to shift everything horizontally. So if I run that, you'll get this. So see, same exact graph. If you turn your head sideways, um, you'll see the same thing, but it's running from this side now. Awesome. Um, and so, as you guys may have noticed, um, there are these little black bars on these graphs. Um, that is actually actually representing the standard deviation um, for these for the data. So, what you want to do if you want to change that, um, uh, or excuse me, if, if, 
If you want to emphasize the standard deviation, um, what you'll need to do is similar to the orientation, you're going to change that parameter. And it's not orientation, though, that you're changing. You're changing the error bar is what it's called. Um, so error bar equal to SD. Perfect. So now we'll run that. And as you can see, we get a much clearer image of the standard deviation than we did in that original graph, right? Perfect. Okay, so that's all I've got for um, bar graphs. Let's move on to a different type of graph. Um, let's create a histogram next. So what we'll do is um, use the histplot function to create a histogram of the, um, we're gonna choose the temp min column. Okay, so all we'll need to do is call Seaborn hist plot instead of bar plot, and then we'll go weather. Uh, do, 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 do. Temp. Uh, temp min. Okay, and just make sure you close everything correctly. Oop, I made a mistake. I noticed it right away. Yeah, make sure everything is put in there correctly. Even like I said, that little underscore missing could create an error. So we've got our histogram or his, yeah, we've got our histogram of the temp min over the entirety of the data set. Just fantastic. Great, so this um, next one that we're going to do, um, we're going to actually add a kernel density estimate overlaid. So basically an approximation um, over this histogram. So take that, add that. And then what we'll also need to do is add this, which is KDE equals true. So when you're trying to look how to manipulate some of these graphs, it'll, it'll be really good to see what is set by the default. Um, and that's what you'll know, need to know what to change or manipulate. So we're setting this to true now, because um, that isn't the default. And now it'll add this um, approximation. So the kernel density estimate um, overlaid on that graph. So that can be a nice little feature that you can add. And there are a bunch of different features like this um, that we'll go over some of, but not all of today. Um, so say you have data, um, temp min isn't the only um, column that we have, say we have others that we want to look at. Um, I think temp max would be a good comparison value. So let's go with that one. So let's move down. So plot weather, and then all you'll need to do to add the other one is just add a comma, oops, and then you're gonna call the other column. So temp max. Great, and then we're gonna want that parentheses to close. Terrific, and now you can see we've got two different sets of data. Temp min stays blue, um, but now you can see temp max is behind it and they're stacked on top of each other. So you can see um, how those are affecting one another. So now um, we're going to go, oh, I, I just mentioned actually them looking like they're stacked. Um, but now we're actually going to um, look at how a new command can actually stack those values on top of one another. So we're going to take that again. Let's do that. And instead of that KDE above, we're going to set a different parameter called multiple. So it knows that there are multiple different columns being considered. Okay, multiple. And then we're going to set it to stack. And now what you'll see is instead of it looking like this and both of the values being true to what, they're, what they are in this actual CSV file, you get new values, right? So these are stacked on top of each other, right? Temp min isn't reaching more than you know 160 on this graph, but here it's going all the way to 300. So you can sort of visually tell the difference between the two there. Awesome. Okay. So now there are just a few more ways that we can manipulate this graph um, that I'd like to show you guys. So in this case, 
let's do the step. Um, we're gonna add step. So instead of multiple, we're going to change the element and make that step. Okay, let's run that. And now you can see they're see-through and it's not again the stack version, it's this version, but it's a little bit easier to differentiate um, between the two because they've gotten rid of these white lines um, in between each occurrence. So that makes it a little bit easier to differentiate the two. Um, or maybe you just like stylizing your graph like this. Um, so that is an option. Um, another option, um, and, and again, this, this is all dependent on your needs and what your data sort of um, constricts you to do. Um, so instead of step, we're gonna change this to poly, and this will create polygon shapes of the graph rather than uh, these very square um, looking shapes. So let's run that. And boom, you can see very clearly there's a big difference. Um, the graph is more um, geometric in, in um, nature um, rather than square. So there's some curves, um, but it might suit your data better than this um, step, step version. Okay. So now let's look at creating a line plot of the temperature data. So um, to do this, we're going to use Seaborn um, line plot. So sns.line plot. Weather. And then actually, let me just copy this from here. Perfect. Don't want to give your guys' selves too much extra work, and also this avoids any syntax errors as well. So we're just going to change hist plot to line plot. And you get one of these. That's a lot of data over time. So you may want to, again, manipulate the specific range that you're looking at, um, which you can definitely do. Um, can also make a scatter plot instead of line. Oops, scatter, that might look like that, right? It's a little different, uh, but similar in nature. Okay, and then looking at our line plot actually again, there are those, the confidence interval that I had mentioned earlier, there's a way that you can actually trace that so that you can visually see it a little bit better. So let's do a line plot. Dana equals weather y equals 10 max. And you can set the values in a different order, but this I found the easiest way to visually see this, um, which is why I wanted to show it to you this way. Um, weather. Okay, let's close parentheses. So see, you can see that confidence interval. This is the actual data, um, and then the standard deviation um, sort of highlighted around it. So as you can see, weather is a really good choice to have because with almost all of the other instances, you're gonna have it be that exact value that exact day, and there's no sort of deviation possible. Awesome. Okay, so, for our final example, um, I don't know how useful this one will be in there. Again, a lot of different types of visualizations that are available, um, but just for the sake of today, I'm not gonna have time to go through all of them, um, but this is the last one I'll go through, which is a pair plot. So again, it's gonna be very similar um, in terms of the structure to this one. I'm just not gonna waste my time. And instead of line plot, you're gonna put in pair plot. And this one is really good for um, comparative analysis of maybe two different data points in our case. So if we do that, we've got temp min and temp max. We can see they're almost inverses, especially these um, points of each other. So um, you can sort of see the differentiation. Um, think of it as like a um, four square. Yes, perfect. Okay, so in addition to um, on my journal, the pip freeze won't work on Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lite that I'm working in. But um, for those of you working and following along in my um, 
notebook, which I'll actually show you guys now. So this pip freeze function at the bottom, scroll all the way down there, right? So that'll list all the installed packages um, for the notebook and their versions. Um, and it also freezes the current state of installed libraries and their version, so it won't automatically update or change or anything like that. Awesome, okay. I'm going to move back to my presentation. So here's again some examples that we used. Um, this is what we did, just a basic overview. We did Seaborn, we checked on the head function, um, we used the info function, and then we did different plot methods as well. Um, and like I mentioned, these aren't the only ones. There are a bunch of other different examples and choices. Awesome. So the final few steps is exporting your notebook as different file formats. Um, here are all the different types of formats you can download as. Um, what you'll do is this file download as your file, your preferred file format. It works very similarly to most um, like Google Docs, documents, programs um, that you're downloading something or a file from. So we'll go over that in just a second. Um, but using those commands above, um, combined with the built-in NBC convert tool, you can export your notebook in any of these formats um, and then upload it anywhere else. So for my sake, I downloaded that um, Python notebook, um, Jupyter notebook, and I was able to upload it into this um, when I wasn't able to figure out what was going on, why, what error was going on. Cool, so these are just some different platforms for sharing and collaborating with your notebook. I specifically use GitHub in this example. Um, as I'll, I'll go through, it's a really nice online hosting service with management tools for code repositories. I can upload and host notebooks just like regular script files. I can go in to a code space and I can edit and then re-push those files to the public and share them. Um, JupyterHub, which is actually what we're using right now, is an open source tool that lets you host a distributed Jupyter Notebook environment. Uh, well, excuse me, we're using Jupyter Lite in the similar vein of Jupyter Hub. So Jupyter Hub, the difference is that you have to register for an account to use online, but you don't have to download uh, or install any software onto your local machine. You can just write your Python code in a web browser. So think similarly to Google Docs or Google Collab, which they also have, um, which also allows users to write and execute Python code in a browser, um, and you can actually store it in Google Drive and share just as you would with Google Docs or Sheets. And then Kaggle Kernels is another um, option which allows users to write, run, and publicly share their code in a no setup, customizable Jupyter Notebook environment. Kaggle is also actually where I got the weather data that we were working um, with today. It has a lot of really great example data um, and other things that um, it also hosts as well. So before we get into that, let me just quickly show you guys. We have a question. Ah, yes, I missed that a while ago, so thank you. Um, okay, so if I go into my GitHub account, which I'm gonna close all of these just so that I can see the right one. Right, not that, not that. Here we go, here it is. So we're gonna restart the code space. So this is the code space. It looks, again, very similar to the Jupyter um, light that we're working in, right? Just a little bit more um, sleek and up to date. So as, as I mentioned in my other notebook example, so if I go here, right, I can't make any changes. This is just published to the public. Anyone can go and access this, assuming that they have the links. Um, but here I can actively make changes um, in the data and then say I want to update that data, right? Um, that's public. So if I were to make a change, which example is this? Um, data visualization. So let me go into data visualizations really quickly. So if I were to make a change, I'm just gonna make a really big obvious one in the markdown checks. Change, <laughs> can't get much more obvious than that, right? Change and it's been saved, so now what we need to do is I'm gonna go, uh, oops, going to go into my file, my profile, excuse me, home, I'm gonna go home, and then I'm gonna go into code spaces, which is where I was working in. So if I click this button, that's 
this, essentially the same thing, right? But if I click this, you see I made uncommitted, it says uncommitted changes that aren't being reflected online. What I can do is I can export changes to a branch. If it, it hasn't already been exported publicly, that's the same sort of process that you would do to make this public. So right now it's creating a new branch, it's exporting those changes to the branch, and once it's done, I'll be able to visit it and it'll just update these um, code spaces that can't be edited um, by anyone but me. So if I go now and I do this, right? Hmm. Oh, okay, I forgot to click create branch. That would make sense <laughs> why it didn't work. Okay, so it'll create that branch. It may take a second or two, um, dependent on how many changes you also made and how much memory that's going to take. Um, as you can see, this whole entire code space is 3.21 gigabytes. So it's not like it's a small thing necessarily, but that's also why it's nice to be able to store it on the cloud and not have to have it on your local machine. Okay, so while we're waiting on that, actually, I don't want to, oh, as soon as I said that, of course, we're gonna see the branch. You get all the files that are there. I click on this. Um, the data visualizations one is the one I changed, right? And as you can see, that change is now reflected there. So. Um, in that sense, you can update all of your code live, even if it's already public, and change it and export it in that sense. Um, and then if I go into Jupyter Lite, I said I would go over how to download. It's super easy. You'll click download on whatever file you want, and then boom, it will download that for you, which is fantastic. Awesome. All right, back to the presentation. Uh, okay, and just to finish off, just a few best practices. Uh, make sure that you're using version control systems um, and keeping track of all the different um, changes that you're making. That way you're not losing any data and you can track back um, if something in your program or your notebook isn't working like it used to or like you think it's supposed to. Um, try making or using different variables or new variables. You saw that I ran into an issue when I set the Seattle weather as a variable and I just changed it to weather. I was able to make things work. Sometimes there are some nuances or just fine details or things that it's particular about, so you just need to sort of work with it. Um, keyboard shortcuts are definitely going to be your friend. Um, you saw me going and copying um, all of those different lines of code, so I wasn't having to go in and type. Definitely refer back to um, here, some of the tips and features, um, you know, pressing Control and Enter to run a cell or Shift and Enter to run a cell and add an additional one below it. Um, things like that are going to be your best friend, to save you time. Um, document your analysis with proper stylized headings, titles, and descriptive captions. Um, I didn't spend much time over markdown text, but I will actually go and just demonstrate that very fast. So, oops. Let's go to, or in fact, let's go to the code space I was working in. Restart code space. So it's super simple. I, I mentioned what markdown text is and if you guys were following along or you guys saw these notebooks, you saw the markdown text that I created. Um, it's super simple. Um, but what you want to do is just make sure that you're writing in a markdown cell if you want markdown text and you're writing in a code cell if you want it to be code. So right now, say I'm at the bottom and I wanted to add, right now this is in code. Um, say I wanted a markdown cell, right? I would just add markdown, super easy. Or you can add them up here as well. So there's different ways to make it look different. Those two hashtags will make a title. And then I can just you know write whatever. And if I click check, it exists, right? Okay, so finishing up, make sure that you're testing and removing your code and staying organized. Things can get out of whack, uh, you can lose things, and it's just really important to keep your directory, your files, your folders, your data, all safe and in one place.
and organized. Awesome. And with that, um, that is my presentation on Introduction to Jupyter Notebooks. I really am thankful for you guys for coming in, following along with me. If you have any questions, concerns, um, things I maybe didn't talk about or address, um, please reach, feel free to reach out to me, shoot me an email. Um, I'm happy to go um, into more detail, answer your questions. Um, and again, I'll be sharing these slides and the um, workshop recording as soon as we have that edited up. And um, yes, so with that, thank you so much. If you have any questions, I'll stay on for just a few minutes. Um, but otherwise, um, thank you so much. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your Tuesday. And please join us again next week for our introduction to SVSS um, data at your desk workshop.